All right, so it is a hot day here at the Rosenmeister Nursery, and we are going to do some propagation. Preferably not under the greenhouse for too long. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> this is probably a three shower day. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I just took my second one. So. Um, the third one's waiting for you then. I guess so. Um, so what I do is um, I use my own potting mix. Well, I modify a potting mm -hmm. mix. I use this um, Pro Mix. Um, Although they say it's peat based, the highest percentage is hardwood bark. Hmm. Uh, peat is, you know, a non-renewable resource. Absolutely. Um, and I find also that the peat perlite mixes are just too light, mm -hmm. especially for woody plants. So I, I like this one. It's, um, I believe, 55% um, composted hardwood bark. Hmm. So you can, you know, you can see the little chunks of the, yeah. the bark in there. Yeah. Um, has really good drainage, um, enough weight. It holds moisture without being too wet. Right. So um, it's pretty simple. I go with four scoops of the potting mix. And I've come to this after years of experimenting. You know, you have to find that Goldilocks spot yeah. between just not too much, not too little. Um, so to four scoops of that mix, I add one scoop of perlite. And do you have a specific uh, size of perlite that you use, or does it really matter? It's called the professional growing mix. Okay. I would prefer a larger size, but it's very it's hard to get it. Yeah, it looks smaller. Um, but we always, I always to joke with people who do a lot of plant propagation in their nurseries because I'm like, how much uh, potting medium do you use to your perlite? Because a lot of people like to use a lot of perlite and, uh -huh. and a little less potting mix, so. Yeah, I prefer the opposite proportions. When I'm potting up roses, I just use the straight mix. Yeah. Now with the perlite, you have to be careful with the dust from it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you don't want to breathe that in. Right. So satisfying, just yeah. taking your hands like through the potting medium. And you know, I do a small mix at a time um, because I'm not going to spend all day taking cuttings. There's enough yeah. other things to do. So in between, I'll do some cuttings, then go do something else. Yeah. There's planting, there's weeding. And I use these um, special pots. <clears throat> because they look cool? <laughs> <laughs> They're called Root Maker. Okay. They were developed by a professor out in the Midwest. Hmm. <clears throat> what I've happens, never seen them. What happens with traditional pots, you know, here's a, a gallon round. Yeah. So, comparable amount of soil. What would happen with any plant when it's in there is the root grows, hits the edge of the pot, and circles. And it could, like, eventually, like, girdle itself, right? Exactly. Yeah. Um, that's why they're telling you, even when you do a, a, a planting hole for a tree, maybe even do it square so that mm -hmm. the, the roots could go out. Yeah, or the other thing is cut channels mm. into the surrounding area oh, where you put some uh, of that amended soil mix. Because yeah. so even, even if it's square, yeah. what happens is the, the tree just thinks, oh, this is where the good stuff is, right. where the soil is. Yeah. And to get them to go out, is tricky. Oh, so, you know, doing those channels. And the other thing is not using as much organic matter yeah. mixing into the soil. Yeah. Um, used to be standard practice for us to put loads of compost. Right. And now the research is saying um, five to 10% uh, organic matter in when you're planting a tree or a shrub is enough. Hmm. And that, that's incorporated in or on top? Incorporated in. Okay. And then initially in planting, they say one to two inches. Mm -hmm. I had always done like three or four yeah, at least. Yeah, of course. And then they say after the initial, half an inch to an inch is more than enough. Hmm, fascinating. Yeah. Always so, new research. Now, they, these have, do these have air pockets on the side too? Oh, no? so what they have, I'm sorry, I got yeah. sidetracked. So the bottom of each of these, let yeah. me take an empty one, um, has mm -hmm. a little air hole. Oh, that's cool. It looks like a little armadillo or something. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Um, so what happens is when the roots get to the side and yeah. they start to grow, they hit the air. So it's like and air pruning. Exactly. Wow. So it, it prunes the root and then it stimulates the root all the way back to put out side branches. Yeah. So you end up with a really, really fibrous nice. root system. Wow. 
Um, so after about six weeks in here, mm -hmm. I could take this, turn it upside down, and the entire mass is solid roots. Oh, that uh, is nice. When you get um, such a large root mass, uh, you get at least twice the amount of top growth, so yeah. I can produce a finished plant quicker. Yeah, that's great. Um, the other thing that's really nice about these compared to these, well, you can see what happens if I'm lining these up on a bench and I want to go water. Mm -hmm. it's enough, enough space in between, but these you could just stack. They go right yep. up against each other, yep. and in my misting bench or when I'm watering, the hose goes over. Yep. There's no wasted water. Yep. You don't lose anything. So sensible. So uh, what I'll do um, is I put four cuttings per pot, mm -hmm. and they'll be there for about six weeks. Um, then I'll take them out, separate them, and then each cutting will go either into one of these or a round pot, depending what my numbers are looking like. Right. I bought a bunch of these years ago, and they're pretty expensive. Yeah, um, which is probably why some of the reasons why people probably just do the round ones then. Exactly. Yeah. And then, when is the best time, you know, we're taking some cuttings right now, it's July. When is the best time to actually take cuttings? Anytime, or? Um, I've taken cuttings, um, well, last year I was taking cuttings in October and they tell yeah. you never to do that. Yeah. Worked fine. <laughs> um, the best time though, really, <clears throat> would be around now. So it's right after um, the first flush of bloom is over. Okay. They've done, they finished flowering mm -hmm. and now they'll put on vegetative growth. Okay. So you'll even see right below the um, flowering shoot, mm -hmm. there'll be green growth coming out now. Great. So hormones are kicking in, they're ready to. I oh, sure, some great. For you? Thank you. Yeah, let me just take that. Let's get out of here yeah. where it's a little cooler. <laughs> I mean, the back of my knees are sweating, actually. <laughs> I didn't even know the back of my knees could sweat. <laughs> <laughs> oh, when my eyelids start sweating, that's when they're, it gets to me. They're like my knee pits. <laughs> I, need, I need some deodorant on the back of my knees. <laughs> you know, you might have found a new product there. I, I probably did if, it's, if this heat keeps yeah. up. It's all about the marketing. <laughs> <laughs> you know what? In my first scent, it's going to be roses. <laughs> I'll use it to mask rose. <laughs> that sounds wonderful. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> I'm sure that'll uh, work really well, and there'll be all those folks who will <laughs> want to um, check it out. <laughs> OK, so um, let me tell you a little bit about the misting system. There's emitters on the top here. Yeah. And um, the tubes go into a three-quarter inch plastic pipe that runs right through the middle. And these tubes, I could just lift this out to show you. I like this because you're using your wisteria pergola as like an, a, a shade bench in a way. Exactly. Right? So, so these, it's, yeah. It's, it's so practical. It is. Uh, some folks, um, talk about doing things in a hoop house and all, yeah. I find having the air circulation is fantastic and yeah. I like the dappled shade this provides. Yeah. So uh, these tubes are pressure fit into holes that run through the pipe, mm -hmm. hooked up to a timer and mm -hmm. what I do is one minute mm -hmm. every hour, mm -hmm. 24 hours a day it just runs mm -hmm. and it takes care of everything for That's me. That's great. Um, let's see, what else do I need to tell you about the bench? I think that's about it. So what are you growing in here now? Like what, do, what are some of those that you've um, cut and put in here now? So variety wise, I've got white cap, mm -hmm. which is a, a white climber that was rediscovered at the Brooklyn Botanical Gardens years ago that's not in the trade. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping to bring that in over the next couple years. Park director riggers. Oh yeah, that red one. Yeah, that yeah. blood red one that everybody yeah. loves. Um, Alchemist, which is exquisite. Alchemist, yeah. you know, the alchemist turn lead into gold. Yeah. And this is an older Cordis rose from 1956. And the colors are so complex. It's got over 100 petals. It's fragrant. Wow. It's gold, yellow, peach, pink. Yeah. And it changes the whole time. And the end blossoms, the end of the season, the colors get even more intense. And what does it smell like? What's the scent? This one is a strong rose scent. Is it? Like okay. Like really a true rose. So nobody would s smell the peach if it's like gold and yellow and... <laughs> well, they might imagine that, but it's not there. 
Um, let's see. Oh, these cuttings right up here are real exciting. It's called Vlatva. Mm -hmm. And this is uh, are some cuttings I had uh, shipped to me from a friend mm -hmm. in California. Um, there's a gal out there, Pam, who's involved with the Friends of Vintage Roses. And she has an amazing collection of ramblers. And this is the result of a cross between two of what we refer to as the blue roses, Valschenblau and um, another rose that I'm not remembering the name right Are now. Are they true blue though? No. It's, it's more of a lavender. A lavender. It's so hard to get true blue flowers. Yeah, There's a lot definitely. of chemistry behind there, yeah. So what's nice about um, Vlatva, it was hybridized in um, Czechoslovakia. And what it does is it carries that blue color over, mm -hmm. but rather than being uh, single to semi-double, mm -hmm. this one is really double mm. and strongly scented mm. with that beautiful mauve lavender color. Mm. Um, and it's not in the trade, so you know it's, it's another one of those roses I'm real excited about. I think I actually remember, speaking of blue rose, sorry to, mm -hmm. to go off track, but I think I remember reading an article about like the pursuit for the blue rose uh -huh. and the Japanese were really trying to get behind it uh -huh. and trying to get to the blue rose. <laughs> it's like, you know, trying to trying for your whole life to get that that specific color that people are coveting, you know. Yeah, it was interesting when you mentioned that because a, a rose hybridizer from Japan just friended me on Facebook a couple days ago. Oh, really? So I'll have to write and ask yeah. him, you know, <laughs> if he's doing anything with that. Yeah. Um, here's another really interesting rose that's not in the trade. It's called Lady Ursula. Hmm. And Lady Ursula um, is being grown right now at the Mills Garden up in Syracuse, which is one of the oldest municipal rose gardens. And I volunteer there once a week, uh, mostly working on the old roses, but climbers and ramblers. Wow. The garden was started in the 1920s. Mm -hmm. um, Lady Ursula was one of the original plantings. It's a hybrid tea. And for a hybrid tea that has been in the ground in Syracuse for over 100 years, Whoa. that's pretty impressive. Yeah. Most of the other earlier plantings are, are gone, except for maybe some of the ramblers. Yeah. For some reason, this is no longer in the trade. Yeah. Um, it's a lovely blush pink. Mm -hmm. um, has that classic hybrid tea look with that high center. Mm -hmm. So. Um, and is that what your your grandmother used to to grow, right? That's yeah, the, those are the kind teas. of roses yeah. she liked. Yeah. They're not exactly my thing. Yeah. Um, folks in the rose society that I'm a member of up in Syracuse do uh, well. All the rose societies do these competitions, rose shows. Yeah. Where you doctor up your rose and present the, the perfect bud. Yeah. And since I'm not into hybrid teas, you yeah. know, I, I really couldn't get into that. It's kind of <laughs> like dog shows. <laughs> but they've been after me for a while to do this. So I figured, OK, I'll put a spin on it. And yeah. what I'm going to focus on are the vintage hybrid teas. Yeah. The hybrid teas, um, they date back to the 20s or 30s that nobody grows anymore. Mm -hmm. And enter those in competition mm -hmm. and, and see what happens. Hey. And whether I win or not, you know, doesn't I, matter. I sense like the equivalent to what was that best in show, and then uh -huh. like the chicken people, where uh -huh. it was like chicken shows. That there, there needs to be a rose one. We're not there yet, but we're getting there. <laughs> oh, there's a book about it called yeah. Otherwise Normal People, and it's hysterical. <laughs> that's uh, a great. That's a great title. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, why don't we um, take a look at how you take a cutting off of a rose? That would be great. I'm going to do two. Um, I'm going to do one first because it's just convenient. OK. Um, this is Hermann Schmidt. I think I pointed this one out to yes, you last time. You did. It was that uh, it's supposed to look like Valschenblau, mm -hmm. but it, it's a little rosier in mm -hmm. its color, but it does fade to mauve. What I do is I look for what's um, this year's growth. So these are all flowering laterals. If you remember, I spoke about the leader and the lateral yeah. before. So this is the flowering lateral. And if I go back to the main stem, these laterals didn't exist in the spring. Mm -hmm. And can you see the base right yeah, there with looks, that little yeah. brown ring? Yep. You got that? So that is a bud scar right there. Mm -hmm. That was the bud that was starting to swell right when the forsythia were first starting to right. bloom. This grew since April. Yeah the full length, the flowers, and now it's in the process of making hips. Right. With um, once blooming roses, what happens is the hips will then send a message to the plant that 
we're done blooming, it's time to prepare our wood for the winter so it hardens off. Mm -hmm. With repeat blooming roses, um, they'll continue to make juvenile foliage and folks will deadhead them to continue the growth of juvenile foliage so they continue to make um, new flowers. Is the juvenile foliage just like the ones that have like a reddish tinge and it's like very soft and doesn't have the... Uh... Um, some of them, it depends on okay. the variety. Okay. Just by juvenile, I mean this year's wood, oh, I see. the new okay. growth. I see. So with the old roses, um, they would bloom on old wood, yeah. the previous wood. Yeah. Uh, repeat blooming rose would bloom on this old wood and then at the end of the summer, there would be you know, a full season's growth and it would bloom on that. Mm -hmm. The continuous blooming roses bloom on both and they continue to bloom on juvenile wood that comes out in between. What happens when you hybridize something that's like an like on old growth plus a continuous? Like what happens? It's a crapshoot. <laughs> <laughs> Usually in the first generation, you'll get a once bloomer. Yeah. Second generation is when you get the repeat bloom. Oh wow, it's so complex, yeah. yeah. So anyway, back to this. There's so much to talk about on I know, roses. you know. Um, so what I'm going to do, ah, the other thing. There's a right and a wrong side to pruners. <laughs> <laughs> so if you notice, there's a blade yes. and there's a wider piece. Yep. And folks say, right or wrong side? Yeah. What are you talking about? You always put the blade side yeah. down uh -huh. against where you want to cut. Okay. Because if I had it the other way, yeah. we would have that little unsightly stub. Right. We don't like unsightly stubs. <laughs> And when I prune that off, I'm going to want to get as close as I can. And let me pull this out. So you'll see I have that ring. Mm -hmm. What happens is that area right there mm -hmm. has um, loads of hormones in that area that will stimulate new root growth. Right, so it's like a, the meristematic area right there where the, where it'll... You're, yes, yeah. you're impressive language. <laughs> <laughs> we'll put the definition up. <laughs> okay, so um, you can get roots yeah. wherever there is a leaf axle. Mm -hmm. So if you cut right here, there would be this whole stub here that it's just a waste. Right. And it's going to rot. Um, I like to get that because I get much quicker and stronger root growth. Right, and, and you'll get all this root growth right around here too, probably with all these leaves. So what I'll do is I cut off the lower leaves mm -hmm. and I don't rip them off mm -hmm. because in ripping them off, I would damage the buds that are inside I there. I see, yeah. And you can maybe see a little bud in there. Yeah, I can see a little one. Mm -hmm. Or the hint of one. It's tiny. And then I will cut And you leave some leaves. Well, let's go where okay. it's a little shadier. Okay. <laughs> so this stuff goes in here. And what I do is I cut back to just two leaflets. And the reason why you're doing that is that it will tr uh, like transpire too much and then wilt. Exactly, so if I leave the, the full leaf on. Yeah. It's just drawing moisture from the plant. It has no roots to give it more moisture. Right. Um, the existing leaflets will produce some food for it through mm -hmm. the chlorophyll. I guess like what I um, haven't really internalized until now though is that the stem is also green at this stage mm -hmm. so it probably could produce some little you know food for the plant yeah. as well. Mm -hmm. And then I will sink it in. Okay. And I press it around so there are probably a good three buds or so yep. that are buried below. It's kind of like when you're planting a tomato plant and they sometimes they would recommend, you know, taking off the last few leaves and then putting it in so that it has stronger roots. Yeah, um, I don't even bother taking the leaves off the tomatoes anymore. You just put them right in. Uh, in fact, what I'll do, um, instead of planting it deep, yeah. is I plant it at an angle or horizontally and I just bury that stem about an inch or two below the soil level. Yeah. Then I'm not having the roots go too far down, yeah. staying up in the surface yeah. where the soil's warmer. Right. Fascinating. So there's um, Hermann Schmidt. Amazing. And um, what I thought it would be really neat to do today um, is take cuttings from one more rambler. That's that perfect. I think that 
this would be a fun one. I think it would be a fun one too. <laughs> so Sander, just be careful as you go backwards. <laughs> He did hit into his first tree the other day. <laughs> and just watch the thorns behind you. We're going to go down to the third post. Okay. So, Sonder, this rose is for you. Oh, is it? <laughs> it's Sonder's White Rambler. <laughs> right. Uh, you knew. <laughs> we had talked about this before. Yeah, but how is it spelled? Is it spelled? S S S, yes. S a N D E R S. Yeah. All right. So it's it's probably it probably has some roots in Dutch, maybe. I don't know. It could be. It's yeah. a, an English rose. Okay. Um, what I'll do is I'll check some of the origin. Yeah. And I'll send you information about oh, that's it. Great. But like <laughs> I, I said, like, I requested. I was like, I'm sure he doesn't have a Joey or a Summer Rain, but he has a Saunders. <laughs> <laughs> so um, why don't? Oh, here's the other thing. In taking the cuttings, you could use thin ones, mm -hmm. but I find a stem that's more substantial, mm -hmm. not puncy, mm -hmm. <laughs> something with some mass, tends to produce a more vigorous, healthier plant. Interesting. So I'm going to go down a little farther, because um, if you notice, the ones higher up yeah, they're, are thinner. they're quite thin. So I'm going to come down nice and low, and I see a, a pretty good one right here. And the other reason to take this one is that these guys are growing right into the path. I yeah. mean, you see what happens yeah, through exactly. here. Yeah, exactly. At night, if I'm walking the dogs and I come through here, you it's... You don't want to get stuck. Treacherous. Yeah. So. Perfect. And this is sometimes referred to as the heel. Hmm. So let's go up and do a Saunders White Rambler. That's perfect. So I take a look and I say, well, I could cut there or there. Yeah. I leave a little bit of a stub. I don't worry that much. I'm cutting my leaflets, leaving some. These are going to be under the surface. Mm -hmm. So we're all set. So when it goes in, if you notice, there's that there. But then wherever there's that little line, yeah. There'll be a bud there, a dormant bud, mm -hmm. dormant bud there, one there, one there. So we've got one, two, three, four, five spots where we're going to get a really nice root system. And then how long do you usually you know, keep these on the bench for before um, they're like ready for sale, for instance? Well, within six weeks, um, they're starting to grow and I'll take them, turn the mist system off yeah. or remove them as if I'm going to do another batch. Mm -hmm. At that point, these will be divided and put in gallon pots. Within probably a month, I could sell them in gallon pots and it'll be a really well-established root system. Mm -hmm. uh, what I find with <clears throat> most folks is that they do better if they start with a larger size plant. So although I could sell a gallon size, I typically will grow them on um, through the fall and the following spring. I got it. Sell them in the spring and they'll be in either a two or three gallon pot. Mm. Substantial plant, huge root system. They put that in the ground, boom. <laughs> you know, with a rambler. Instant coffee. <laughs> yeah, uh, with a rambler you'll get maybe five, six feet of new canes from the base shooting up. I can believe it because the way that multiflora rose grows, uh -huh. like, I mean, forget it. Like, I think that if it, if it has any of that genetic structure in it, then mm -hmm. it's going gonna, it's gonna to put out a lot of canes. Now, there's another part that's really important, and that's proper labeling. <laughs> <laughs> because oftentimes when people order roses, yeah. they end up ordering a rose and what they get, did I spell that correctly? You did. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, you know, when you're doing lots of cuttings, it's real easy to mix them up because a lot of times these cuttings don't look all that different from no, each other. No, no, no. If you, if you like kind of mess these up, I would be like, I'd not, I would not know. <laughs> so, um, you know, I used to try and do multiple roses at a time mm -hmm. and I put them in rubber bands and. It got too confusing, so now I usually will go out and I'll take four to eight cuttings yeah. from a rose 
Um, work on those, set them in, go back to another rose, and yeah. then I don't make mistakes. Yeah, well that seems smart and sensible. You know, it takes a little longer, but um, I don't like getting a rose that's not what it's supposed to be, yeah. and I don't want my customers to experience that either. Right, so then if you, if I get this and you, I, you know, get it in spring or whatever, is the best time to plant in spring and fall, kind of similar to the same thing for for here? This um, with potted roses, mm -hmm. you can plant any time from the first week in May until the ground freezes solid. Wow, okay. So I could um, show you what the cuttings look like that I took last October, That'd be if great. you want to see. Yeah, I'd love to see that. Let me it's just... nice to show the progress. Sure. Even if they're not the same the same rows. Right. We get the we get the gist. It's confusing. <laughs> Which way do we go around here? I have to predict where you guys go. <laughs> I predicted raw. <laughs> or maybe we're supposed to pay attention to him. <laughs> you should have just followed me. <laughs> well, that would have worked. It would have been the long way around the barn. Oh. All of these nice. roses were cuttings taken in October. Oh yeah, I'm gonna get those Japanese beetles. Um, and if you take a look what's happening now, um, this was the cutting that was yeah. planted, uh, taken in October. It had a couple little leaves. Um, this is this year's shoot. That's unbelievable. And this was, um, they were, I, because they were potted or rooted so late, I left them four to a pot mm -hmm. until April. Mm -hmm. And about the second week in April, I divided them, one in each pot. So this is what came in a one gallon pot. Mm. <laughs> since April. So we're wow. looking at uh, two months. Yeah, that's crazy. And do you just sell here or do you like, do you take them to like trade shows or farmer's uh, market or? Um, pretty much I sell from the nursery. Yeah. Um, there's sometimes special events through master gardener groups yeah. and I'll sell at those through cooperative extension. The American Rose Society has conventions yeah. and I'll bring roses then. Um, where, where does that take place typically? All over all the country. Over. Okay. So it depends on yeah. every year, yeah. Um, this fall in September, I'm going um, to Cape Cod. I can't wait. Oh, that's um, nice. The Cape Cod Rose Society, besides having a, a regular spring show and a, event, does a lobster fest in the fall. <laughs> so uh, we'll get there on Friday, and there'll be a sunset boat cruise on the water. And then Saturday night is a lobster fest, and the uh, the uh, Cape Cod Rose Society folks are a lot of fun. They know how to party. Yeah. And then uh, during the day, there'll be tours of gardens and meetings. I, I have a question. Did you ever take, this might be too much information, a bath with rose petals in? <laughs> <laughs> I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> Lee, there's still time. <laughs> I'm not too old. I'm not dead yet. Now, uh, you... <laughs> I don't know if you're familiar with the story about ancient Rome and what happened with one of the emperors. Mm -mm. He was like crazy about roses and he would have these... Minions? Well, he would have these orgies and parties. <laughs> and it was set up so that there would be holes in the roof and he would have his minions pouring buckets of rose petals <laughs> down through the holes. Calm down before you stress up the groove The energy a little different when the blessings accrue Ain't who you talking to, just know I ain't no regular fool Could be anything in the world, but I can never be you So his guests would be completely covered in rose petals. <laughs> I'll send you some information about this. Um, there was a, a famous painting done, and there's a story that uh, there were so many rose petals that his guests suffocated. But <laughs> what sounds, a way to go. I mean, that sounds more like a James Bond episode or something, you uh -huh. know. <laughs> but, oh, you know, those the, Romans, you those know. Those Romans. <laughs> well, this is, this is great. I mean, you make it look so easy and just like look how prolific they are after just like a season. It's, it's amazing, so. Yeah, and yeah. Um, using this method, I had over an 80% take on my cuttings. And if you notice, I don't even use root, rooting hormone. Yeah, no, yeah, not necessary, it seems like. And some of them are even flowering, yeah. you know? Well, I think the key too is like just a, that misting bench setup is like, it seems uh, super practical and easy enough to do. And it, it makes less labor for you mm -hmm. and you could just like set it and forget it. 
and you can root all kinds of things in there. Yeah. When my friends here, the misting bench is up. <laughs> They're bringing stuff by. A buddy of mine brought some um, Hakuro Nishiki. It's a variegated, a dappled willow. Yeah. So he brought eight cuttings because he wanted to expand this bed of, of willows. And um, I was trimming my bonsai. Yeah. Uh, this is the time for pruning bonsai. Yeah. And I had um, two different varieties of quince, a double red and a single peach. Um, and the pieces that I cut off, I said, I can't throw this away. Yeah. So I stuck them in the misting bench <laughs> and, you know, come spring, I'll be able to sell some bonsai starter stock. Amazing. Well, thank you so much, Lee. This is uh, very informative and thank you again for making the time in this heat. Oh, my pleasure. <laughs> and um, come spring, you'll have my that rose. white rose. You're going to get your rose. And you know what? In that new place where we're designing with the gazebo, that's where it's going to go. Probably. Yep. Climbing up. Yeah, that's that's what the plan was. You didn't know it, but that's what the plan was. Thanks a lot. I <laughs> yeah. appreciate you guys coming out yeah, again. Yeah, absolutely. If you haven't heard yet, we'll be donating and investing 10% of our YouTube AdSense revenue from this channel back into the Finger Lakes community. We're so thankful that Espoma, our partners across both Plant One On Me and Flock Finger Lakes channels, will be matching those funds this year as well as through a combination of monies and or products, depending on the project. So just know that by watching these videos, you're helping the community here.